Gosh, it's great to uh, be in the Midwest for a high fall season. Uh, I haven't always been a Californian. I've lived in California for just about 30 years now, uh, since just after I graduated from law school at the University of Chicago. But I grew up in Aurora, Illinois. I, so I'm, I'm a, you know, a solid, real person from the place where uh, people like that come from, not these coastal, uh, effete intellectuals. And I've, I, I've really gotten uh, in touch with my roots during the past couple of weeks because I'm, I'm now at the beginning of the fourth week of a 10-week lecture tour. Can you believe that? Um, the first week was in Indiana, where the down-home folks at Purdue, Notre Dame, and... Uh, the uh, Indiana University, and then I spent a week in central Michigan at Michigan State University, where they were really pleased to tell me all sorts of things about the University of Michigan. <laughs> but I've learned since arriving here that I just can't believe all of them. I, um, there are actually academic buildings here instead of just a cow pasture, so I think they took advantage of my uh, ignorance to, uh, to tell me these stories. I've been in New York State now for a week, just come back from... Uh, fighting my fourth annual battle with the scientific atheists of the Cornell Biology Department. And uh, after, this was to be my week at Ohio State University. Now, you've heard of that. Uh, uh, but uh, because uh, the scheduled lead, lead-off speaker for this uh, Veritas Forum, uh, Ravi Zacharias, has been having uh, trouble with his voice, I uh, was pressed into service, and uh, I'm... Ohio State uh, loaned me uh, in, in exchange for a future draft choice. Uh, so, so here I am. I'm going to Ohio State, then to Texas universities, and then to 10 days in Spain, which I'm very much looking forward to, lecturing at Spanish universities, then back to the U.S. for three more weeks of the same, and I'll finally be done. That's the punishment that you get for uh, writing a book. Now, let me start here by, by telling you about a book not my own, unfortunately, which received a great endorsement from the New York Times last year. And in fact, this is the kind of thing where you can tell the Times was on a campaign to get America to buy the book, to read it, and especially to believe it. The book was titled The Beak of the Finch. It was by a journalist, a science writer, named Jonathan Weiner. Uh, the, the book so pleased the editors of the Times that they offered Mr. Weiner's space in their magazine section to summarize the book in, a, in an essay. Um, two weeks later, they published a completely laudatory and uncritical review of the book. This treatment was also extended by other uh, uh, parts of the elite media enterprise uh, with the result that the book won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, this is all just about as good as uh, happened to the law professor um, uh, whose book was held up by President Clinton, who said, I want every American to read this book at a press conference. Would that such things happen to me? Oh. Um, now, uh, the, um, the article which uh, Mr. Jonathan Weiner did based on his book was called The Handy Dandy Evolution Prover. Um, and uh, in this article, which summarized the main uh, themes of his uh, book, he talked first about how remarkable it was, how remarkable he found it, that here in the late 20th century and in the civilized cities, even university cities of America, he was continually running into people who did not, he put it this way, did not believe the theory of evolution. Now, these were uh, people, often uh, professional people, people with advanced degrees, uh, even, uh, uh, or uh, uh, just uh, uh, people with less education but who seemed uh, uh, otherwise completely rational, but when he told them about the theory of evolution, uh, they would say they did not believe it. And each one of these people who dissented, according to Mr. Weiner, was a biblical fundamentalist, a biblical literalist, that they uh, uh, endorsed the uh, Genesis story and its chronology exactly as it is given. They were completely ignorant of scientific evidence or indifferent to it uh, and simply close-mindedly endorsed this um, religious story. So he told a few stories about people like that that he'd met, a dentist, I think, a repairman, and so on, um, and, and said that it seemed so absurd to him that such people could still exist because he had actually seen evolution in action. He was like the famous journalist H.L. Mencken, who you've all heard about, who when asked if he believed in infant baptism, 
answered, believe in it, I've seen it happen. So Jonathan Weiner had seen it happen. The reason he'd seen it happen was that he um, went out on assignment to spend some uh, time with a couple named Grant, both scientists, man and wife, from Princeton University, who study the um, uh, fauna of the Galapagos Islands. Uh, In particular, uh, they have made a careful study of the finches of an island, of Daphne Island in the Galapagos change and the variations from year to year in the beaks of these finches. Now, those of you who are at all well read in evolution will know that this is a famous part of the evolution story. In fact, these finches are often called Darwin's finches uh, because uh, Charles Darwin visited the islands on the famous voyage of the Beagle many years before he published The Origin of Species and he collected specimens uh, from all of the islands. Ironically, it seems that Darwin himself didn't notice anything particularly important about these specimens. Uh, They became important exhibits in the case for evolution long afterwards, after they were analyzed by other scientists at the British Museum. Uh, But in any case, um, they've since always been uh, part of the evolution story. Um, And uh, uh, here they emerge again as, one might say, exhibit A. The most spectacular example of evolution in action that the Grants witnessed on Daphne Island involved a finch species that was greatly reduced in numbers during the terrible drought year of 1977. The beaks of the next generation following the drought were on an average 4 to 5 percent larger than before and better shaped for opening the last tough seeds that remained on the island following the drought. Then, in 1983, this is six years later, the floods came, many finches died again, and the island turned rapidly from desert into jungle. Then the next generation of finches after the rains uh, had smaller beaks, which fitted them to enjoy the multitude of tiny seeds that became available. Beak size thus went through a cycle caused by environmental changes from small to large and then back to small. I can say that if you want a reference to the scientific papers, you need look no further than my own book, Darwin on Trial, uh, which was published three or four years before Mr. Weiner's and has all of this um, uh, described in it. The uh, leading article by the Grants published in Nature is called Oscillating Selection in Darwin's Finches. And that, of course, is what it describes. You have finch beaks, um, the average size of the beaks in the population of finches um, was uh, somewhat larger, 4 to 5 percent, not a great amount following the drought, and then back to normal uh, following the rains. Uh, no permanent change whatsoever. Now, a laudatory review of Weiner's book, which was called The Beak of the Finch, A Study of Evolution in Our Time, appeared in the Sunday New York Times book review section uh, two weeks later, as I've already uh, told you. Like Weiner's own magazine essay, it began by commenting upon the astonishing persistence of biblical creationism among persons who otherwise appeared to be perfectly reasonable. It attributed this to a lack of knowledge of these very examples of of evolution in action. And I quote from the review, which says, Although there is abundant, hard proof of natural selection and the origin of species in the form of fossils embedded in the Rock of Ages, the evidence is far more subtle among living creatures. The review then praised Weiner for demonstrating that evolution is not just a theory about changes that happened in the remote past, but a process that we can watch because it goes on around us all the time. As Weiner himself wrote, after one has seen evolution actually happening, debating the reality of the process seems as absurd as debating the existence of gravity. The reviewer added to this, the secret of life is that it can change with environmental changes and continue to thrive, and if I were searching for signs of an infinitely wise creator, I might find them here. Now, I'm telling you this story to begin the lecture because it encapsulates beautifully what I call the official caricature of the creation-evolution debate, a misleading stereotype which is foisted on the public through all of the organs of publicity which the scientific apparatus and the governmental apparatus can command. 
Um, the official caricature has these elements, uh, which you can see all were present in that story as I told it. First, evolution is extrapolation of observable change. The process the Grants witnessed on Daphne Island is the same as the fossil process, which we're told is recorded um, uh, of uh, ages past, and constitutes essentially the whole history of life. Evolution is extrapolation of observable change involving random genetic changes accumulated by natural selection. That's the first element. Second element. Scientists all agree that evolution in this sense is the explanation of the entire history of life, that is, the major innovations. Birds, finches came into existence in the first place, and birds in general, and animals in general, and vertebrates in general, and, um, uh, 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 and, and in fact all forms of life came into existence by this process of slow, steady, gradual change extrapolated over vast uh, spaces of geological time. Scientists all agree that evolution in this sense is the explanation of the entire history of life. All the evidence, including the fossil evidence, proves that this is so. So that people who don't understand that evolution in that sense of extrapolation of observable change just don't know the scientific evidence or are indifferent to it. Well, who are these people? The dissenters. Third element. The only dissenters are creationists who are defined as biblical literalists who believe um, uh, in the creation account as it's given in Genesis and in the compiling of the gene genealogies and on that basis are convinced that the earth is only um, about 6,000 years old or at any rate less than 10,000 uh, rather than hundreds of millions or billions of years old. This is the only dissenting group of any substance. And finally, the fourth element, religion in a proper sense, is not threatened. The young earth Genesis literalist position is threatened by the theory of evolution, but theistic religion, including Christianity, is not. The secret of life is that it is, can change with environmental changes and continue to thrive, and if I were searching for signs of an infinitely wise creator, I might find them here. So that the claim is that there's nothing for Christian theists who are not completely uh, devoted to the literal Genesis account, Genesis account to be concerned. Now, all of these elements are grossly misleading. Grossly, and I'm afraid I must say intentionally misleading. Uh, they set up a stereotype in order to protect a dogma from criticism. In explaining why this is so and how the stereotype misleads, let me start at the end. Let me start with the claim that if one were looking for signs of an infinitely wise creator, uh, one would find them in the theory of evolution as understood by the mainstream scientific authorities of today. This is a falsehood. In fact, uh, any reading of the literature of evolution uh, uh, will show you that without exception, all of the authorities who have any influence in the field take the view that evolution in the Darwinian sense, evolution in the scientific sense in which it's understood today, is a completely mindless, purposeless, materialistic pro process. It is not God's way of creating. And its message to us is that we are created by a purposeless material mechanism that cares nothing for us or what we do, and certainly not by an infinitely wise creator or even a stupid creator, uh, but rather by a totally mindless uh, creator. As I say, this is in all the lit literature. All the leading authorities take this position. Some are more tactful than others in stating it, but no one dissents from it. Let me just give you a couple of examples uh, from Stephen Jay Gould the famous Harvard uh, geologist, paleontologist, and popular writer on evolution. He writes, Before Darwin, we thought that a benevolent God had created us. But now, he says, that view is intellectually untenable. No intervening spirit watches lovingly over the affairs of nature. Although Newton's clock-winding God might have set up the machinery at the beginning of time and then let it run. No vital forces propel evolutionary change. And whatever we think of God, his existence is not manifest in the products of nature. In other words, you can imagine God back at the ultimate beginning of time, 
and setting up the natural laws, if you want to imagine that sort of thing. But after the beginning of time, uh, there is no role for the creator. Evolution is a mindless, a personal, impersonal process. Before Darwin, we thought that a benevolent God had created us, but after Darwin, that became untenable. Or let me turn to uh, Douglas Fatuma, author of the most widely used college evolutionary biology textbook. Fatuma says, first, that since the world and its, he says, if the world and its creatures develop purely by material physical forces, and he's just before that has said that that's in fact what science teaches us, that the world did develop purely by material physical forces. It follows that it could not have been designed and has no purpose or goal. Nowhere does this position apply with more force than to the human species. Some shrink from the conclusion that the human species was not designed, has no purpose, and is the product of mere mechanical mechanisms, but this seems to be the message of evolution. I'll give you just one more quote um, uh, because it so uh, perfectly summarizes the position, but I just want to say I could go on quoting on this all night. I'm not telling you anything that's in the least bit controversial in evolutionary science. Evolution is a purposeless, undirected, thoroughly material process, not something that God even conceivably could have directed or used for a purpose. Here's George Gaylord Simpson the author of the book The Meaning of Evolution, from which I take this, and one of the leading figures in founding the modern understanding of the Darwinian evolution, the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Simpson writes, although many details remain to be worked out, it is already evident that all the objective phenomena of the history of life can be explained by purely naturalistic or materialistic factors. They are, these phenomena are readily explicable on the basis of differential reproduction in populations, that's natural selection, and the mainly random interplay of the known processes of heredity. Therefore, mankind is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. This is before gender-neutral language. Man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Now, so we're not looking for signs of an infinitely wise uh, a creator here. Um, uh, rather, um, uh, we are looking at a system which does not allow room for a creator of any kind. Now, if we understand that this is the what one might call the metaphysical or religious claim of evolution, that our true creator is a purposeless material process, not the infinitely wise creator who brought about our existence for a purpose, then what is the most important claim that evolutionary science makes? Now, it's not the claim that finches have the capacity to vary in response to environmental circumstances and thus improve their fit to the environment from time to time in local occasions in a, in a cyclical way. Remember that the article was called Oscillating Selection in Darwin's Finches. It's a back and forth process, not a process that's going anywhere. Indeed, I would say that such a process is in fact a sign of a very wise creator. That is, that the creator endowed these creatures, like many other kinds, with a capacity uh, for variation in response to local conditions. The important claim of evolution is also not that the process of evolution took a long time, that the process of biological creation took place over hundreds of millions of years uh, rather than over a single week. It isn't the claim that it was a gradual process of genealogical continuity of some kind um, uh, instead of a sudden process. Those claims may be important in their way, but they're not what the theory is all about. What the theory is really about is the mechanism that gets the creator out of the realm of biology, out of the entire history of life. And I think the writer who has done the most to make this, uh, cl this issue clear and to make the claims of evolution clear uh, to the ordinary reader is Richard Dawkins, the famous uh, zoologist of Oxford University um, and uh, a leading media figure as well as uh, an author on behalf of Darwinian evolution. Richard Dawkins begins his book, The Blind Watchmaker, by saying the following. Listen to this carefully because it's hard to believe that he began the book by saying this. He says, 
Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Now Dawkins is very clear of what he means by that. Uh, if you saw, see a spaceship or a computer, you know that it's full of interacting complex systems. That the whole thing wouldn't make sense if all of them weren't present together. You can't have just uh, one of the components, and it's useless. I mean, a, a component that perhaps took hundreds of millions of dollars to build for a space program only has usefulness in terms of all the other things that it's uh, interrelating with, and life is like that. Uh, Dawkins also acknowledges that living organisms are full of information, an information that can be loosely analogized to a computer program. That is only an analogy. shouldn't be taken too literally, um, but it, it conveys the idea that there is an there is information there that is telling the cell how to do all of its functions, that coordinates this thing which is much more complicated uh, than anything that human science has been able to build. Um, so biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And if, of course, that appearance were the reality, if they, if they look that way because they actually are designed for a purpose, then Darwinism would hardly be telling us that um, uh, mankind is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have us in mind. So, of course, the next step in Dawkins' reasoning is and must be that this appearance is deceiving. That, in fact, if you understand evolutionary biology, you know that the complicated organs of living systems are the product not of an intelligent creator, but of a purposeless system, which is what he calls the blind watchmaker. He says natural selection is the blind watchmaker. Blind because it does not see ahead, does not plan consequences, and has no purpose in view. Yet the living results of natural selection overwhelmingly impress us with the appearance of design as if by a master watchmaker. So we are talking about the illusion of design and planning that is actually produced by a mindless process. Now, uh, how does this happen? How does this work? Well. Now, this is what I want to get to, but I want to preface this by warning you about a move that will often be made in discussions of Darwinism at this point. Uh, often, the Darwinist will say, well, you know the mechanism is a problem for us. We have these arguments about mechanism here in our scientific fraternity, but don't worry about that. We're all agreed that evolution is a fact. Evolution happens. We breed dogs. The finch beaks actually vary. Um, and there is change in the history of life. So evolution has occurred, and that's all you really need to know. The mechanism issues are just technical arguments by the in-group that you don't need to worry about. Well, I think if you followed what I've said so far, you can see why this is false, why you should never be misled by that. The mechanism is what the thing is all about in terms of the purpose of getting God out of the system, of getting the creator out of the history of life. Without a mechanism for generating all this interrelated complexity, uh, you have a, a, a process which may be interesting in certain respects and worthy of, 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 uh, of uh, further scientific study, uh, but it doesn't do away with the need for a creator. Now, What's a, how does a blind watchmaker mechanism work? Well, I always love to use Dawkins' own example. Um, now, you understand the blind watchmaker mechanism has to do a whole lot of things. Um, it has to account at the beginning in some way extended before biology into chemistry to get the origin of life. You have to somehow extend this process back to non-living chemicals which somehow manage to uh, combine and create living organisms. That's a subject in its own that I'm not going to go into. At the other end, uh, you have the problem of accounting for the highest level things, specifically human consciousness, self-awareness, and reasoning abilities. That has always been a very difficult point for natural selection theory, uh, but uh, uh, Darwinists have been confident that difficult though the issue is, somehow you can account for human consciousness and intelligence that way because the theory has been so successful up to that point. So I want to deal with a mid-level example that is considered to be the kind of success that gives Darwinists the confidence that their theory can be extended to cover such seemingly intractable problems as the ultimate origin of life and the origin of human consciousness. This is the story of how the bat got its wings. Now, um, we must imagine the story starting with an ancestor of tree-dwelling animals, a kind of a uh, perhaps primordial chipmunk uh, 
a, a, a small four-footed creature which climbs uh, uh, through the uh, trees, and not something that exists today, but some hypothetical ancestor of, of uh, the animals that exist today. And now we start out, and I'll quote directly from Dawkins from that point. How did wings get their start? Many animals leap from bow to bow and sometimes fall to the ground. Especially in a small animal, the whole body surface catches the air and assists the leap or breaks the fall by acting as a crude aerofoil, wind resistance. Any tendency to increase the ratio of surface area to weight would help, for example, flaps of skin growing out in the angles of joints. It doesn't matter how small and unwing-like the first wing flaps were. There must be some height, call it H, such that an animal would just break its neck if it fell from that height, but would just survive if it fell from a slightly lower height. In this critical zone, any improvement in the body surface's ability to catch the air and break the fall, however slight the improvement, can mean the difference between life and death. Natural selection will then favor some slight prototype wing flaps. And when these small flaps have become the norm, the critical height H will become slightly greater. Now a slight further increase in the wing flaps will mean the difference between life and death, and so on until we have proper wings. Well, now you see what might have been a very complex story of how genetic information, a program to coordinate all of the elements necessary for flight, including not only the wings, uh, but the skills, the connection to the brain, the supporting structures, the peculiar uh, adjustments that have to be made, is reduced to a story of flaps of skin growing between the digits so that you can imagine um, the flaps of skin uh, gradually turning into wings. Um, the story, I suppose, is conceivably true if certain elements can be met. Uh, uh, first, it presupposes that mutations, random mutations, provide the necessary improvements in the structure, in this case, the flaps growing into wings, bit by steady bit, uh, just when the next step is needed, uh, one after another. Now, why is it bit by bit? Why not all at once? Well, this uh, refers to a long-standing difficulty within the Darwinist paradigm that, that, in fact, started out as an argument between Darwin and his earliest disciple, T.H. Huxley, who said that the theory would be much more credible if it could proceed in big jumps rather than tiny steps. A Dawkins, like a Darwin himself, refuses to countenance that possibility. He says that the mutations which would be selected by natural selection have to be very tiny, in fact, so tiny that they probably could not even be observed. Uh, his reason for this is that when, mu that when mutations do have observable uh, effects on the phenotype, that is, on the body, um, they're almost always harmful, frequently fatal. And so the assumption is that very small mutations uh, might uh, be adaptive uh, and not harmful, and that they could accumulate through natural selection. But the price that has to be paid uh, for this method of proceeding is that you need a whole lot of these mutations, and they have to arrive on schedule, and they have to provide not only the wing flaps, but all of the other things that this uh, er chimp chipmunk, we might say, needs in order to turn into a bat, the echolocation uh, apparatus and all of the other um, uh, distinctive adaptations uh, uh, for its uh, 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 flight. Now, the, 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 the mutations coming along and providing all of these things are purely hypothetical. Mutations, when they're actually observed in the world, are almost always uh, either have no phenotype effects, or if they do, as Dawkins said, they are, uh, they, they are overwhelmingly uh, harmful. And the, um, the harmfulness of mutations is particularly likely uh, uh, to be the rule because, as Dawkins well knows and quite uh, forthrightly acknowledges, uh, it is not the case that there is a single gene f that controls something like wing flaps or a single characteristic of the animal. Uh, rather, each gene tends to have multiple effects um, so that a change in it will, will have a variety of effects. And each significant character of the animal tends to be controlled by several genes. Uh, so that even a, a, a genetic change would had, which had a, uh, a particular um, beneficial effect in one respect uh, would be likely to have a number of other effects which in the by statistical likelihood 
are likely to be harmful. Now, one can see the likelihood of harm, in fact, even without talking about these multiple effects and so on, because as you might well imagine, a creature which depends for its life on climbing and grasping and finds flaps growing between its digits uh, would seem to be very likely uh, uh, to be at a disadvantage in its normal way of life long before these flaps became useful for flying or even gliding. Now, all of this is speculation, of course. Can we say that any of it's true? Well, th the problem is that the whole process is speculative. Uh, the, uh, the necessary mutations are purely hypothetical. Uh, the effect of natural selection in selecting for such a, a specialized thing, uh, surviving the fall, is entirely hypothetical since uh, uh, w there, there are so many other ways that the animal might die that we ha can have no idea of how uh, powerful this effect would be. Um, and uh, the process itself is never observed. It's not observed in the living world and can't be. Um, and it's not observed in the fossil record. Bats, like other creatures, uh, tend appear in the fossil record as bats, uh, fully formed, and not at the end of a process of gradual transformation from something else. If that process occurred, all the historical evidence of it has been lost. Uh, and uh, uh, so... Uh, there is no possible way of confirming uh, the story. Now, um, uh, and with this, all of these difficulties in this particular hypothetical scenario, and I, I pick it out only as an example of something that we see occurring uh, 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 throughout the record, what's, what's going on here? Uh, how can a story that depends on so many uh, un, un, uh, demonstrable assertions uh, be accepted as fact? Now, um, uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, within the scientific world itself, and from people who have no discernible religious motivation for descending from evolutionary naturalism, we find that there is, in every generation, a fairly consistent pattern of dissent of people saying that the Darwinian story is simply not consistent with the evidence. Um, in each case, it seems that the dissenters are heavily criticized for abandoning science by so doing, are asked to come up with their own theory that will suffice to replace Darwinism, and they're unable to do so. Uh, one example of this, I'll just give you a couple of uh, quick examples to show you this, uh, how this descent is going on in the present day. Niles Eldridge is a very famous paleontologist, fossil expert, at the American Museum of Natural History. He's perhaps best known to the public as the co-author with the more famous Stephen Jay Gould, of the Punctuated Equilibria papers, which achieved some notoriety in the 1980s. Uh, punctuated Equilibria uh, is a fancy language uh, for a paleontological view that the prevailing pattern in the fossil record is of sudden appearance. New things appear in rocks of differing ages, but when they appear, they appear fully formed and with no evidence of a process of gradual change from something else. And stasis which means that once they're there, they stay the same. There's minor oscillation, just like the oscillation in Darwin's finches, you know, minor oscillation around a norm, but no directional change whatsoever, a stasis. Now, because Gould and Eldridge uh, uh, publicized this view of the fossil record, they were accused of being traitors from Darwinism. They were thought to be saying that evolution happened suddenly, overnight, by single-generation jumps. But you see, in that case, there would be no mechanism. If the bat appeared with its wings just out of nowhere, that's an act of special creation. That's a miracle. There's no scientific um, uh, explanation for that. And the distaste for Gould and Eldridge because of this uh, uh, feature uh, was so great that their theory was labeled evolution by jerks and disdain throughout the scientific world. Now, in, in, in reaction to this, Gould and Eldridge swore that they hadn't meant to repudiate Darwinism, that they were good Darwinists, and that the invisible process of change that appeared as sudden appearance was actually Darwinian. It's just that it occurred in small populations, in nooks and crannies here and there, where it was never observed. And, of course, a completely invisible process can be anything that you want it to be. Uh, now, um, Eldridge has gone so far to avoid the taint of heresy that he tells audiences, he says in his, most, in his book, the 1994 book, Dar uh, Reinventing Darwin, that he is a knee-jerk neo-Darwinist. A knee-jerk neo-Darwinist. Now, think how interesting it is for an eminent scientist to describe himself that way. 
And say, I mean, to be a knee-jerk anything implies a willingness to overlook disconfirming evidence, a willingness to believe in spite of the facts. And indeed, that must be what he means, because here is what Eldridge says in that 1994 book about what he observes in the fossil record. I quote, and this is, by the way, a very typical quote from Eldridge. It's not out of context. It's not atypical. It's not selected. You know, he says this all the time. No wonder paleontologists shied away from evolution for so long. It never seems to happen. Assiduous collecting up cliff faces yields zigzags, minor oscillations, and the very occasional slight accumulation of change over millions of years at a rate too slow to account for all the prodigious change that has occurred in evolutionary history. When we do see the introduction of evolutionary novelty, it usually shows up with a bang, and often with no firm evidence that the fossils did not evolve elsewhere. Evolution cannot forever be going on somewhere else. Yet that's how the fossil record has struck many a forlorn paleontologist looking to learn something about evolution. Now, clearly, whatever is motivating Eldridge to make all those fervent protestations of belief in Darwinism, it isn't anything he's seeing from his own scientific studies in the fossil record. Uh, similarly, another uh, famous uh, person in the world of evolutionary science is Brian Goodwin, an embryologist whose book, How the Leopard Changed Its Spots, The Evolution of Complexity, was also published in 1994. Uh, Goodwin uh, writes as follows, uh, from the perspective of somebody who studies development, embryology, the process by which the genes change into the adult organism, the baby in the womb, although, in fact, uh, Goodwin deals primarily with simple uh, forms of uh, life in his studies. He says... Despite the power of molecular genetics to reveal the hereditary essences of organisms, the large-scale aspects of evolution remain unexplained, including the origin of species. There is no clear evidence for the gradual emergence of any contemporary uh, of any evolutionary nov novelty. New types of organisms simply appear on the evolutionary scene, persist for various periods of time, and then become extinct. So Darwin's assumption that the tree of life is a consequence of the gradual accumulation of small hereditary differences appears to be without significant support. And Goodwin goes on to describe how he has to discard that whole way of thinking in order to approach his own subject in any realistic way. Now remember, this is the very claim that it is the accumulation of these small changes over vast periods of time that the New York Times and Jonathan Weiner are telling you is something that all literate people agree with and that only some very close-minded religious extremists are, are disposed to, to disagree. Now, what's going on here? If you're convinced by the critique, well, the question that must be in your mind is, how does this happen? I mean, how does this scientific culture, this a whole scientific profession with all these intelligent people uh, dedicated to the pursuit of truth uh, come to such a preposterous a situation as to say that there's no rational reason for doubting a picture of evolution that just doesn't fit the evidence. Well, I think I understand what's happened. When the Darwinian theory was first proposed in 1859, it took hold of the scientific imagination almost overnight as these things are measured. When Darwin died in 1882, his coffin was carried by earls, uh, peers of the realm, deposited in Westminster Abbey, and he was buried just down the row from Sir Isaac Newton. Um, Darwinism seemed to give science an understanding of the whole life processes based purely on the naturalistic, materialistic, unintelligent factors uh, that are accessible to scientific investigation. No messy vital forces, no messy creator, nothing like that. The whole of the situation was in the control and understanding of naturalistic science. Now, there were doubters from the beginning, including among Darwin's closest supporters. I've already mentioned that T.H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, said that Darwin ought to have allowed for saltations, and that was because the fossil record, which Huxley knew well, looked just like the record that Niles Eldridge describes for us today. Huxley also said uh, that he would not be persuaded that Darwin had the right approach to the theory until the breeders of animals demonstrated that they were possible of create, that they could create new species, and particularly new organs and things that hadn't existed before, rather than merely bring out variations within the type, which is what the breeders told Darwin they were really doing. Um, Asa Gray, Darwin's great Amor American supporter, uh, a botanist, uh, said that he accepted the theory only provisionally and he did not believe the variations that propelled it were random. He thought they came from God. 
Uh, but Darwinists of the early time had reason to feel that the theory was so logically appealing um, as a naturalistic explanation of biological complexity, and particularly as an explanation for the classifications, for the fact that there are groups like animals, which are within larger groups like vertebrates, that this could all be explained by a process of descent from common ancestors, seemed so logically appealing that they thought that the problems would be solved eventually. The breeders would show that you could make new things by selective breeding. And great hope was placed in the fruit fly experiments in particular to actually make this demonstration. The fossil hunters going out and motivated uh, uh, to find transitional forms, to fill in the fossil record so that it would actually show instances of Darwinian evolution, would surely succeed. Um, and so the theory pursued on faith was pursued on faith. And indeed, um, success was claimed. Because when you have a scientific enterprise dedicated to filling out a paradigm in which careers are advanced and rewards, prestige, uh, honor, fame, glory, and even money are dispensed to those who succeed, obviously success is going to be reported. Uh, people are going to find what they are determined to find and no must be there. And hence fossil sequences and so on were sometimes reported, often to be discredited later on. Now, in the present situation, we can see that all of the problems are still there. They haven't gotten better. Uh, finch beak variation is still just finch beak variation. And I know many people within evolutionary science who wouldn't take seriously for a moment uh, that this is an example of the process that gets you animals in the first place. The record just doesn't show that. The fossil record, despite these determined efforts to fill it in, despite the determined efforts to find the Darwinian intermediates, is just as bad as it was in Darwin's day when his whole approach to the fossil record was totally uh, uh, defensive. The fossil record is incomplete, he said, and I never would have realized how incomplete it was until I saw that it didn't show any of the transitional forms which my theory requires to have existed. Think about that. Now, but what do we have today in the situation? Today, the great problem in the situation is a political problem. The scientific world, the scientific rationalists, and much of the university intellectual world in general feels under siege. They feel under siege from something they call the religious right, the fundamentalists, a group which they often define so broadly that it seems to include everybody who believes in God. Uh, they feel that, uh, uh, that that is a siege on one side, that, and, and indeed there is cause for fear considering how greatly the prestige and authority of the scientific establishment is committed to this New York Times story that we've proved that microevolution extrapolated is the whole history of life. Think what the cultural impact would be of a retreat from that position. They have cause to be worried. But there's another enemy, and this one, though not so large as the so-called religious right or fundamentalists, uh, which may be as much as 75 or 80 percent of the American public on some definitions, um, this one is closer to home, and that is the postmodernist left, the deconstructionists, the multiculturalists, who invade the universities with notions that each group has its own fundamental assumptions, uh, that there is no single kind of rationality which is adequate, that um, and uh, uh, that uh, 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 different ways of uh, fundamentally different ways of thinking can be equally legitimate. Uh, now, a measure of how worried the scientific establishment is by the multiculturalist left may be shown in the fact that the New York Academy of Sciences held a meeting on the subject, a, a large uh, meeting just a couple of months ago with all the leading figures coming and trying to plan on what they could do to meet this menace. The same kind of meeting that they held 15 years or so ago to deal with the uh, a creationist challenge and the balanced treatment for creationism uh, movement. There's a lot of concern and there's a great deal at stake because what is at stake here is the authority of a priesthood. A priesthood is a professional group that has the authority to tell its culture what reality really is, what's real and what's not uh, a real which is in charge of our cultural definition of reality is telling us that there is no need for a creator, that we can abandon that thought uh, because these processes of mutation and selection, the very processes that Jonathan Weiner saw on the Galapagos Islands and that Richard Dawkins hypothesizes in the case of the bat, are our true uh, creator. Well, I don't believe the situation is very stable. I think we're going to see a great change 
uh, in the future. Uh, many people uh, find it hard to believe that anything so solidly established as Darwinian evolution can actually come into serious doubt, serious fundamental philosophical level doubt in the universities. But consider what the basis of Darwinism is in reality and what the what its relationship to the rest of the experience of the 20th century has been. Here I'm going to quote from Douglas Fatuma's textbook. I've already referred to Fatuma. He's a professor at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and his textbook is the most widely used in college evolutionary biology courses. Now, I'm quoting to you from a biology textbook. This is important to understand, not a popular work or a philosophical work. But here is how two biology students, Douglas Fatuma, describes what is important about Darwinian evolution. I quote his words. By coupling undirected, purposeless variation to the blind, uncaring process of natural selection, Darwin made theological or spiritual explanations of the life processes superfluous. Together with Marx's materialistic theory of history and society and Freud's attribution of human behavior to influences over which we have little control, Darwin's theory of evolution was a crucial plank in the platform of mechanism and materialism, of much of science, in short, that has since been the stage of most Western thought. Well, think about that. Darwin, Marx, and Freud, the three minds that did more than any other to make the 20th century. Of all of these, Darwin's accomplishment was the most basic, he provided the materialistic understanding of reality. That understanding was taken uh, by seminal figures like Marx and made into a great theory of history and society. And so much of the 20th century has been the product of that idea. On the other side, you had Freud uh, and the notion of the unconscious, of sexual liberation, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of all of the things that uh, applied to the individual human being that might be different as a result of this materialistic uh, theory of reality. But we've now come to the end of the century of scientific atheism. Marxism has been so spectacularly discredited that it retains its prestige only in certain of the loftiest of ivy, ivory towers. Um, uh, Freud is not regarded even by his admirers as having any scientific standing, but merely as an imaginative figure who said many interesting things. But the basis of the 20th century has been this materialism. And at the end of the 20th century, we find the uh, relativism, the intellectual chaos, the nihilism that that interpretation of reality has so much invited. It's time that we reconsidered that basis and I believe the time is right when a well-informed public, which is not motivated by prejudice or by unthinking adherence uh, 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 to uh, 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 older uh, accounts of uh, creation, but by a spirit of open inquiry and analysis, will force finally a very reluctant and unwilling intellectual establishment to admit that our creation story is very, very flawed, and we have been very, very misled on this subject. Well, that's my lecture. Now we'll have a word from our organizers, and then we'll have the question period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.